Good morning. We're coming to you from Doers of the Word Baptist Church at 14781. It's 14781 Sperry Road in Newberry, Ohio. Our zip code is 44065 for you folks out there listening to us on the Liberty Works Radio Network. That's 104.3 FM, the Eagle in Tampa and Ocala. I'm Pastor Randy Sanders, and the title of the message today is Beware of the Dark Inversion. Beware of the Dark Inversion. And uh, we're going to get to what that Dark Inversion is all about here uh, in the midst, a little later in the message. But we start today in 2 Peter chapter 3. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, you're going to see here that uh, Paul, or Peter, in this, this limited passage of Scripture chapter, uh, says four times he exhorts us to remember, to remember, remember. Today, uh, so many of the people today in this country have such short memories uh, and uh, very, very short attention span, especially in the public school system today. And uh, it's one of the reasons they've got the kids all drugged up. But we start off here uh, in verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Now, uh, a pure mind is one that has not been defiled by the neoliberal establishment. You know, today it's better known as the Antichrist system or the, the collective. And so, with that, uh, I want to turn over real quick to Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, we read in, in just verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And not be conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he's talking about being transformed, not in the transformation that we've seen in America today. America has been transformed, but not for the better, for folks. And uh, that's what we'll be talking about. And, and, I, and I'm hearing people say, how many times someone said to me, well... But you don't understand, preacher. I'm a mature Christian. I'm mature enough in my faith that I can partake of the worldly life without, well, without ever affecting my Christian faith. Uh, they don't usually say those exact words, but the gist of the message is the same. And I've heard it time and time again. In other words, well, you can kind of wait around out there and into the worldly things, but your faith is so strong it doesn't really affect you. Wrong. Wrong. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. And if you think you can sit there and watch garbage on television all the time, uh, listen. Unless you got a burning in your belly, unless you are into God's Word seven days a week. Yep. Yep. Exactly. No fool with the folks. The Apostle Paul, he was way ahead of you where it comes spiritually. That's right. And he didn't touch it. Yeah. And so, what you need to do is try to understand what you have if you have a King James Bible. If you've got the greatest source of information that's sitting there. Yeah. And again, the time will come when only, only that's going to matter. All of the worldly things and, and uh, people... I say that they're they're going to be spending. They say this country is going to spend somewhere in the area of eight billion dollars on Halloween. I believe it. On Halloween, uh, it's getting worse and worse. The the things they have out there on TV. And Chuck was just telling me about uh, uh, this morning about some kind of a uh, weird uh, statue or something they had out uh, there. Was that? That was in Canton. In Canton. Okay. Uh, and it was, well, tell the folks what, what, what that was. Well, there was a personage that was, that was crucified upside down. And uh, they had, of course, they had uh, nails to the hands and the feet, and they had needles through the neck. 
And this uh, house that had this first inch was very close to an elementary school. The kids wow. had to walk by that and see that. So. so there you go. I mean, you're seeing more and more of that as we're getting deeper and deeper to the apostasy, as we're seeing the, the difference between the, the righteous and the unrighteous is growing, and it's growing remarkable. Okay? And you need to try to understand that, that the world that you're living in is becoming more and more dangerous every day. And uh, <clears throat> turn over for a quickly to Hebrews chapter 2. And in Hebrews chapter 2, I just want to read verses 1 through 4. Now, in this passage of Scripture, should dispel any and all notions that one may have about, uh, again, worldliness not affecting their faith in the Lord. In verse 1, we read this. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Again, he's referring back to the scriptures. Now, folks, you need to be in the, in the Word of God every day. See, one or two things you do. You're either in the Word of God every day, or the time will come when you have wished that you had been in the Word of God every day, right? Yeah. I mean, that will happen. And see, my, my job is to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So if you, if you want to, want that, go to one of these prosperity churches, they'll tell you whatever you want to hear as long as you put money in the plate. That's what they're there for, right? For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first begin be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also hearing them witness both with signs and wonders and by diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So what is he talking about? So great a salvation indeed is a great truth. The very name Jesus uh, means salvation. So it embraces uh, many major doctrines of scripture, the word salvation such as atonement, substitution, imputation, propitiation, redemption, remission, justification, adoption, reconciliation, regeneration, and sanctification. So, if we turn, go back to where we left off in uh, 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 3, and we, uh, 2 Peter 3, right? Knowing this first, that there should come the last days scoffers after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant. Listen, for this they are willingly ignorant. For this they are willingly ignorant. First of all, all things don't remain the same, folks. Okay? The world was destroyed by water. And the heavens were destroyed by water. That's not going to happen again. This time it's going to be fire. And you can count on that. It will happen exactly as it says. It's, you know, the Word of God, uh, you have you know, a couple thousand prophecies, and most of them have been fulfilled already. Exactly when, exactly where, exactly how, without fail! Uh, God's got a, what you call a perfect record of always doing what he says. And then he'll go on top of that. He said, I have said it and I will do it over and over and over. For this they are willingly are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Well, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And if this is a familiar passage of Scripture, because nowadays, 
uh, with the media. And we're going to take a look here in a minute of, of some of what is going on. We're going to take a look at the definition of this conversion, this dark conversion. But in, in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, we read this. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. Uh, in other words, he's making a point. Listen, we're getting it done. We're getting it done. We don't find these excuses. You know, so many people have so many excuses. I can't believe today some people, uh, they, they, they say, well, you know, I'd like to come to your church, but, you know, you're almost 15 miles away. Folks, there used to be people in the early days of this country, sometimes families would walk 10 miles <coughs> in a day to go to church. And in the early, early church, folks, listen, the preacher sat down and the congregation stood while the preacher preached. A lot of folks don't know that, but people will tell you that that's, that's too far for them to drive. And here he says again, lest we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling of the word of God deceitfully. Now, that's exactly what is being taken, what has taken place today by the apostate church. They are handling the word of God deceitfully. They are uh, taking it and inverting the word of God. So as we take a look at this, we see... But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Well, the only thing that can pierce us through that darkness that blinded them is the light of the gospel. You see, that's what you are to do. You are to bring that gospel to the lost. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you, sometimes the lost people out there, uh, they can uh, really be a problem. Uh, they cannot be very likable at all. Okay? Uh, as, as Scripture says, as were some of us <coughs> before we were saved, right? And so, uh, the idea is to bring them that gospel of salvation. It's a two-edged sword. God's word, God's word, God's word never returns void. It might appear that it has returned void, but it never does. Uh, it'll do one or two things. It'll either reach those that are lost, and it'll convert them, or it will, it will judge those that, that reject it and condemn them. But God's word never returns void. Never. He goes on to say, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, he's telling you, look here. God, God himself dwells in these earthen vessels that we have called bodies that were made of clay. God himself dwells within us. So think about that. Did you, ever, did you ever really think about that? God is dwelling within us? That is an amazing thing, right? Because when you think about it, what is the most powerful, powerful force in existence? God. So we have within us what? The most powerful, powerful force source in existence, don't we? Right. We have the most knowledgeable. Well, within us, all knowledge is there, right? That's why you don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost. Because, boy, does he know how to make you wish you had, right? Oh, yeah. And so, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 17, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. You notice every passage is about the mind, the mind. That's what we're dealing with today. Because that is what the world is going after. The world is going after to transform your mind. 
Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the form of the conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the lust. Again, he's going back to the same thing. Get away from the ways of the world. The old man was in the ways of the world, world. You want to get away from that. You don't want to feed that old nature. You want to strengthen your, your, your new nature, right? And then, if you go to Acts chapter 26. And in Acts chapter 26, verses 14 through 18. Our Lord is speaking here. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in a Hebrew tongue, So! So! Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You see, old Saul saw the light. Why did he see the light? Okay. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of these things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith, that is, in me. Now you see, old Saul was converted on the spot. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He thought he had it on down pat. He said under the teachings of Gamaliel. Uh, but all of a sudden, he saw the light big time. You notice something? When, whenever the Lord Jesus spoke, he spoke with absolute authority. Do you know that you can do the very same thing every time you preach from here? You've got that very same thing. Right here it is. And I'm going to tell you, it drives liberals crazy. They hate absolutes. And they, and they hate absolute authority. And of course, you always hear uh, that saying, which is a mis, misquote, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely wrong. Power can't corrupt for sure, but there's only one absolute power, and that's God, and he's not corrupt. And it's not a smart thing at all to say that he is. Read Malachi chapter 3. Those fellows found out when they told the Lord they... They had it all figured out now. You see, Lord, you're saying one thing, but you're doing another. We're watching what you're doing. And we're noticing how the wicked, the evil people are being rewarded. They seem to prosper. So what you're telling us, you're telling us one thing, but you're doing another. You're blessing the wicked. Folks, don't ever tell God he's a liar. Um, you see, when God introduced them to dung, he introduced them to dung. You see, where you had the... Uh, he said they would be buried and dug up to their face. What does that mean? Well, where they would bring the animals into the temple there to sacrifice on the outs. You know, what they used to do is they would clean up. And um, they would take it outside of the gates and they would leave it outside. And what he was telling these guys is you're soon to be buried outside the gates. Meaning you're going to be at room temperature. Right. See? In other words, they knew instantly that they had made a major mistake when they told God that he was a liar, right? That's it. Now, there's going to be a whole lot of people going to learn that. I mean, a whole lot of people in this world today are going to learn that. And those that, that, that mock God continuously. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan into God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. So that's our job, is to bring the, the salvation message to the lost. Now, old, old Paul here, 
he, uh, he turned out to be quite an evangelist, didn't he? Amen. He really turned out to be quite an evangelist. And in fact, he wrote, he wrote, I think, more of the Bible other than in the New Testament, more of it than anybody. Right? Yeah. Uh, he's kind of like Moses in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Well, we were talking about inversion. First, I want to take you over to Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, starting with verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. Well, he's making a point. First of all, when you get a woe from God, that's not a good thing. And what he's saying here is, woe unto them that parade their sin as if they put it in a cart and pulled it in front of God and say, look here. That's exactly what happens every time they have a sodomite parade in Cleveland. That's exactly what happens uh, when they have these, uh, when they celebrate these sodomite days. Mm -hmm. Thus, that say, now listen to what they're saying here. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. In other words, let's parade our sin in front of God and see what God does about it. Well, folks, let me tell you what a holy God does about sin. He punishes it. That's what he does. Now, woe to them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justifieth the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. It goes back to those that just want to stay in the world and practice the things of the world and embrace the things of the world. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, as the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, as smitten them, and the hills have trembled, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street. For all of this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And that means God's on the throne, he has not lost any of his power, and he punishes sin. Amen. Folks, just like he always has. That's what a holy God does now. I want to get into this definition of inversion. And I want to do it here. Here's an article here. This is Whistleblower Magazine. And this guy, he hits the, the nail right on the head. It's Douglas Ernst. And it's Obama's Orwellian Executive Order. This was passed on September 15th by Executive Order. And uh, in short, what this does, but I'll read it to you. They've come up. Uh, you re you, some of you may remember the name Cass Sunstein. He was one of those... Uh, of the Obama czars, people that believe that there should be no age limit on abortion. Uh, you know, if you have the kid for a couple of years and it's not turning out any better, maybe three or four by now, you should be able to uh, eliminate them anyhow. I mean, these are some people also that believe that uh, once you hit the age of, of 70, you should voluntarily, uh, you know, cash in your chips. I don't agree with any of that, right? And so, here, I'm going to just read to you this article here. New behavioral experiments to result in government policies to better serve the American people. Now, pay close attention to what he says, because the whole idea is to invert the wording, just like what we just read in Isaiah. They call it good, evil, evil, good. You use terminology, and that's what they're doing today, in fact. I gotta tell you, to show you the insanity of some of this. Cal uh, no, that's the wrong article. Let me get you the right article here. This this is absolute insanity. And I think I I'll find the article here in a minute. <laughs> okay, here it is, folks. Guess what? This is what they're doing now in your university. 
Evade, mind-boggling new terms for guys and gals. You see, so they have these new terms. You, you can't use the word he or she now. In college campuses are changing that to uh, words like EA or EM, okay? EA for, for males and EMs for females, okay? Uh, then they have a whole list of these, these terms that are very strange terms. Well, I looked at this and I thought, you know, these folks need some help. So I came up with a, a way to simplify this thing uh, because they have a, I mean, just as they've really gone through a lot about these terms. And so what I have done is I've narrowed it down to this. This thing or that thing. You see? So when they want to say this thing here or that thing there when they're in the classroom, right? And uh, what do you think? I think that would work, this thing or that thing, it narrowed down. But um, anyhow, I'm going to read this article to you, because you really need to hear this. Welcome to Obama's brave new world. Federal agencies have been directed to hire psychologists to experiment and to put it bluntly, find ways to better manipulate the American people to the federal government's will. A growing body of evidence demonstrates that Behavioral science insights, research and finding from fields such as behavioral economics and psychology about how people make decisions and act on them can be used to design government policies to better serve the American people. Obama wrote an executive order uh, released September 15, 2015. We were the only people talking about it. I, I don't know of one other person on the radio or in the media anywhere. We were the only one talking about this just kind of went under the radar. And they always do these things like on a Friday night. Um, on the White House, Gov. The origin of the order can be traced back to 2013 policy proposal entertained by the White House called Strengthening Federal Capacity for Behavioral Insights. That means controlling the people. According to Obama's new order streamlined applications for federal financial aid and automatic retirement payments are two examples where behavioral science lessons applied to government programs have been effective. To more fully realize the benefits of behavioral insights and deliver better results at a lower cost for the American people, the federal government to design its policies and programs to reflect our best understanding of how people engage with a uh, participate in use and respond to those policies and programs. Obama has not hidden his interest in using federal resources to employ, employ behavioral science techniques on the public. The White House launched a social and behavioral science team, SBST, in February of 2014 and then celebrated its one year anniversary on the White House blog. SBST has successfully first year launched a wide variety of evidence-based pilots with objections ranging from connecting veterans with an employment and educational council benefits, helping struggling students borrow, understanding their loan repayment options, the Obama regime wrote on February 9th. All of that, everything they've done, especially with the VA, has been a total disaster. I mean, I mean, it's a total disaster. One third of those veterans that were on the list for help died waiting for medical help. At the same time, he's given billions of aid to all of these illegal aliens he's bringing in from all over the country. They're getting billions of aid. Okay. Not only that, in Germany now, uh, it's an interesting thing because in Germany, the The school kids in Germany have been instructed to go out and clean house for the Muslims that they're bringing into Germany now. That all of these Muslims that have come in, uh, because the Muslims that were offended if they didn't. Uh, there you go. As a part of school work, children are required to make beds, cook, clean for Muslim immigrants in Germany. And uh, on the back. You might pass that around. People can see. Take a look at how they've left things. Well, by the way, 
the Ayman of the Ayman of Oregon's largest mosque told Muslims they should go out and kill Americans. That's what we've been telling you about. So these things are happening in this brave new world that we're in today. And I wanted to take you over.